What is going on, Alabama Nation? It is Kyle Henderson of BamaInsider.com. Thank you for joining us on the BamaInsider.com podcast. Today's The Drive is sponsored by your name here. If you want to advertise on BamaInsider.com, get your word out to thousands of Alabama football fans, then email Kyle at BamaInsider.com. We'd be happy to have you as a sponsor. Saturday night is finally here. Number one, Alabama takes on number three, Florida State. September 2nd in the Atlanta, Georgia, brand new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It's here. And on the program today, we got an action-packed lineup, tons of good interviews. We have Nick Saban's press conference that we're going to play here in a minute from Wednesday night. His final thoughts from the Florida State game. We also have Andrew Bone of BamaInsider.com talking about the recruiting matchups and who's going to be in Atlanta watching this big game in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Got some big-time prospects. We also have Ira Chaffel of Warchant.com, and he's going to provide some backstory to what Alabama football fans should expect from Florida State. We all know Florida State is going to bring the heat. We also have Tony Sakalis of BamaInsider.com, our young and ambitious team rider. Does a wonderful job. He's going to paint the backstory on Alabama football. We're going to talk position groups with him. We are also going to play the teleconference from Wednesday. Both Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher spoke to the media. So we have an action-packed show and wanted to read you a couple of interesting stats going into this game. These stats are provided by the University of Alabama. In dome openers under head coach Nick Saban, Alabama has played in seven season opener games in a dome stadium in those seven contests. The Crimson Tide is a perfect 7-0 dome sweet dome. The Crimson Tide is 24-7-1 all-time in dome stadiums, including a 15-2 mark since 2009 and is 16-4 under Nick Saban's tenure. The Tide was 3-0 in indoor stadiums in 2016. Remember, they beat USC 52-6 in the season opener last year at AT AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. Opening day success under Saban. Alabama has been dominant in season openers under Nick Saban. The Tide is a perfect 10-0 under Saban and has won in impressive fashion. Alabama has outscored its opponents by an average score of 41.1 to 12.0 points per game. Alabama has also amassed 440 yards per game to the opponent's 196 yards per game. More key stats. Saban in Alabama. Alabama's Nick Saban has a 13-1 career record in games played in Atlanta as head coach. At Alabama, he is 10-1 and was 3-0 at LSU. Saban's Alabama record includes a 5-1 record in the SEC Championship game, a 4-0 mark in Chick-fil-A kickoff games, and his 1-0 record in the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl, all which were played in the Georgia Dome. More Nick Saban stats. Saban against former assistants. Alabama's season opener with Florida State will be the 11th meeting between Tide head coach Nick Saban and one of his former assistant coaches, Florida State's Jimbo Fisher, with Saban's offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach at LSU from 2002 to 2006. Saban is 10-0 all-time against his former staffers during his tenure at Alabama. As we continue to talk about this matchup, here are the returning stat leaders for both teams. The returning Rushing leader for Florida State is Jaquez Patrick. He ran for 350 yards last year with four touchdowns. Of course, passing-wise is DeAndre Francois, who threw for 3,300 yards, 20 touchdowns, seven interceptions. Receiving-wise, Naquan Murray, 27 receptions for 441 yards and five touchdowns. Leading the team in tackles, Matthew Thomas, who is now eligible, 77 tackles last season. For Alabama, the returning stat leaders read... Damian Harris at running back, 146 carries last year for 1,037 yards and only two touchdowns. Passing was Jalen Hurts as a freshman, threw for 2,700 yards, 23 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Receiving-wise, Calvin Ridley hauled in 72 receptions, 769 yards, seven touchdowns. And leading the team in tackles, Ronnie Harrison, 86 tackles, two interceptions. Of course, don't forget, Minka Fitzpatrick, 66 tackles last year, six interceptions. Jimbo Fisher, one of the most successful coaches in college football right now, found this interesting. Since becoming Florida State's head coach in 2010, Jimbo Fisher has played an SEC 
opponent 10 times, seven regular season meetings with Florida, as well as the 2010 Chick-fil-A Bowl against South Carolina, the 2013 BCS National Championship game against Auburn in 2006. And in 2016, he played Ole Miss. Florida State is 9-1 in those matchups, with Florida State winning both bowl games. Now, the most wins since 2010, Nick Saban at 86, Jimbo Fisher right behind him with 78, Clemson's Dabo Sweeney, 76, Chris Peterson of Washington, 70, and Urban Meyer since 2010, 69 wins. So Jimbo Fisher, I mean, what what a coach. And I think, you know, the coaching matchup is something that we certainly have to look at going into this game. Now, while either coach isn't going to mention the pressure of beating one of their, you know, a, a former associate, if you will, I think in the back of their minds, these guys are super competitive and you do not want to lose to anybody, especially someone you used to work with. And in this case, Saban, 10-0, going up against Fisher. Fisher, young, ambitious, wants to beat the mentor. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if Florida State can do just that. Here is Nick Saban's Wednesday night press conference. He opens up giving his thoughts about Hurricane Harvey provides his final thoughts about the preparation for the Florida State matchup, talks about Raekwon Davis, as well as gives an update on running back Joshua Jacobs, talks about Jimbo Fisher's offense, and gives an update on special teams. Here's Nick Saban's press conference from this past Wednesday night. You know, our thoughts and prayers are with those that are affected by, you know, Hurricane Harvey. Uh, We're thankful that our players' families are safe and people aren't in harm's way even though some issues do occur with some of the families which we won't discuss here and we're looking for ways as a department uh, and personally to try to assist uh, the best we can uh, in terms of all the victims in uh, southeast texas i think the players worked very well today in shells Uh, we kind of have two thursday practices before the first game Um, intensity was good Um, mentally or better. Uh, I think the most important thing from here on out is, you know, the physical preparation other than, you know, a light practice, kind of a light practice tomorrow. Um, So a lot of it is about mental practice. You know, how much mental preparation, mental practice do you get, whether it's watching film, going over things with the coaches, make sure and you're well prepared to do your job uh, so that when you get there, you're going to be able to go out there with confidence and do what you need to do to make the plays you need to make. Um, this is a very good team. So, you know, I think preparation is very, very important relative to their players and the system and schemes that they use. So, um, you know, that's always a key, especially in the first game. Probably the team that can play with the most discipline and toughness, make the fewest mental errors, take care of the ball, probably will have the best chance to be successful in the game. Uh, Raekwon Davis did do a little bit of stuff in <laughs> excuse me in practice today. Um, he's still day to day, and it's a medical decision as to when he can come back and be able to play. I was wondering how Jimbo's offense has kind of stood the test of time since I mean you had him at LSU when he's now. How it, how has it stood the test of time as uh, the games evolved? Well, I, I think it's a very well-conceived pro-style offense. I think he's very good at making changes relative to his personnel. Um, there are similarities to some of the things he did back even at LSU, um, but it's sound, it's good, it's well-executed, it's well-taught, um, and it works. And that it, the reason it works is they do a good job of executing it, but uh, they have a lot of things that they do a little differently now that are – um, great additions to what they do. Uh, and I just think they do a great job with their players in terms of their system is good, and they do a really good job of teaching it, coaching it, and the players do a good job of executing it. Uh, Josh Frazier's been around here for, for a while now. How ready is he for uh, a big role? Uh, well, I think line? Josh Frazier's had a good fall. Uh, he's had a good summer. Uh, he's got his weight down. Um, his play has certainly improved consistency, and um, he's, um, he's got a role in, in the two deep. Um, in some situations, he'll be a starter, um, and the guy's done a really good job, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see how he responds when he goes out there and 
um, gets the opportunity to play against a good team. Is that in front of Mark? Uh, yeah, two quick ones, if I may. Uh, first, a quick update on Josh Jacobs. Will he be able to play? He has not practiced yet. He's still in rehab, uh, still working to try to get the strength back in his hamstring. Uh, if he can't practice tomorrow, he probably won't be playing in the game. And, and then the second one, have you figured out what you want to do on kick return and, and punt return? Who are some of the guys working back there? Uh, yeah, we have, you know, several guys that are very capable. Um, you know, Trayvon Diggs did it last year pretty effectively. Um, Henry Ruggs has done it pretty effectively. Uh, Xavier Marks has been back there before and done it. That's on punt return, and some of those same players can do kickoff return. So, um, you know, I, I, I feel good about the progress that we made in that area. Uh, how has Sean Dion Hamilton's uh, progress been, obviously, coming back from, from the injury? And also, how much did that, oppor uh, that injury provide the opportunity for Rashawn to get much needed experience coming into this year? Well, I, I think, first of all, you know, Sean Dion has had a good fall camp. I think he's confident in his um, situation relative to his injury. Uh, he's played very well. He's very instinctive. He knows our system very well. Um, so he's always been a very dependable guy out there that you can count on doing what he's supposed to do and doing it very well. Uh, I think when uh, Rashawn got the opportunity to play in the last two or three games of the season last year after the SEC championship game, I'm sure that uh, made him a lot more game ready relative to having confidence and knowing what it takes to prepare to play well in a game. And um, he played well for us when he had to play last year. And uh, I think he's got a better understanding of uh, what his role is and what he needs to do to be a leader on this team, this defensive team this year. We'll wrap things up here with Alex. I think I, I saw there were 10 or 11 you know, true freshmen on your two deep. I guess going into a game like this, big big contest, you know, national scene, what do you kind of hope to see from them on that stage that tells you maybe they're ready for more going forward? Well, you know, some guys will have a bigger role than others, obviously, but um, a lot of those guys have earned their way to be where they are. Uh, and it's, I don't know how they'll respond. Um, you know, it takes a lot of maturity, I think, uh, to be able to respond in these kind of situations. And when you have young players, it's always interesting to see how they respond. But what, what, however they do, these guys are good players that can help us we need to help them grow and improve. Um, this will give us a good idea of where they are, and then we'll know what we got to do to try to get them where they need to be. Um, and th that's kind of how we do it with all of our players, but especially important with young players, especially those that we feel can have a role and can contribute to our team. Thank you, Coach. All right, thank you. Next on the program, we have Andrew Bone of BamaInsider.com. Coming to you from the lovely city of Birmingham, Alabama. Bone's going to break it down in terms of what this matchup means recruiting-wise. Give us some backstory to the recruiting matchups between Alabama and Florida State. Here is Andrew Bone of BamaInsider.com. As we, are, as we dive into this game, I mean, there's so many storylines around the actual game, but the recruits that are going to be at this game, I mean, big-time names. Why don't you go ahead and, and give us that updated list of who's going to be in attendance uh, for Saturday night? Well, I think there's a lot of excitement with, uh, with the guys who are going to be on Alabama's uh, side for the uh, for the game on Saturday night. Uh, you have Emory Jones, the five-star quarterback uh, out of Georgia who's committed to Ohio State, continuing to show interest in Alabama. So that's huge to get uh, him over for the game. J.J. Peterson, Alabama's top linebacker target out of Georgia, uh, plans on being there. Patrick Sertain, five-star defensive back out of South Florida, uh, number one defensive back in the country. Uh, huge to get him on campus for the – or I say campus, I mean Atlanta for the, uh, for the game uh, on Saturday night. Uh, his teammate Tyson Campbell not going to be able to make it to the, uh, to the game. But Alabama's still in very good talks with him. I think Alabama's got a really good shot uh, landing his signature. Uh, another big name coming in, a couple, couple of guys from out of the region. Luke Ford, number, Alabama's number one tight end target right now, number one tight end in the country, plans on being at the game. I think Alabama's in the driver's seat for him. 
Jalen Waddell. That is a huge get for Alabama to come over for the game. Uh, you know, one of the best wide receivers in the country, out of Houston, Texas. Um, plans on attending the game on Saturday night. Uh, Justin Ross, five-star wide receiver out of Central High School in Phoenix City. He's the number one player in the state of Alabama. Uh, so getting him over for the game is is another huge deal. Um, you know, another kid to kind of keep an eye on, we mentioned earlier, is uh, Harold Joyner, uh, the four-star running back out of Mountain Brook. Plans on being at the game, so he's really one to watch. But, you know, there's several guys who are going to be in attendance at the game on Saturday night, and you know, Alabama is certainly excited to get a lot of these guys um, over there for the uh, for the game. And we're here with Andrew Bone, our recruiting analyst, as we continue to break down this Alabama versus Florida State game. And always, especially recruiting, Bone, throughout the years, Florida State and Alabama have battled for some of the top prospects in the land. Can you highlight the history between these two recruiting-wise? Well, most recently, you look at some of the guys, um, especially from the 2017 class that signed with Alabama, guys who flipped from Florida State to Alabama, uh, Daniel Wright, uh, safety, and Vanderis Cohen, the linebacker, you know, two guys who were uh, longtime commitments to Florida State who end up flipping. Uh, you know, Mika Fitzpatrick uh, showed a lot of interest in Florida State, visited Florida State a couple times, including an official visit, and there was there was very heavy talk that and he was going to flip his his commitment uh, you know, to Florida State, but he ends up holding on, and, uh, and Alabama obviously uh, you know won out big with uh, with him being a uh, you know unanimous All American. Of course, um, you know there were some guys on on Florida State side too who were uh, who strongly considered Alabama. Uh, Cam Akers, for example, the freshman running back, uh, probably going to see him uh, a lot on Saturday night. Uh, he was once committed to Alabama in the 2017 class, uh, but I think he was really kind of just looking for a place to, uh, you know, a place to maybe make an immediate impact a little bit sooner. And also, not as uh, uh, kind of a recruiting class wasn't as crowded as uh, as Alabama was. You know, you had Najee Harris, who was the number one running back. You had Brian Robinson, so he had another top 100 uh, running back. So. You know, two of the best running backs in the country were already committed. I don't think he was scared of competition at all because Cam Akers is an absolute freak. But I think um, I think he was really just kind of looking for a, you know, um, maybe a, bit, a little bit better opportunity to uh, to compete right away. Um, but you know, he was one of the big names. Um, uh, Keith Gavin, four star wide receiver out of uh, out of Florida. A lot of people thought he was going to Alabama. He he had, he expressed a very heavy interest. It was a top two for for a, for a very long time between Alabama and Florida State. And in the end, he decided to stay a little bit closer to home. But you know, year after year, we're going to see top recruiting battles between these two schools because you know there's just so much uh, you know there's so much talent that comes through every single year. We see these guys get drafted. We see these teams play for uh, play for championships. And you know these are two of the you know, best head coaches in the, in the country, and Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher, and they're also two of the best recruiting coaches in the country. So, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna see um, you know a lot of recruiting battles between these two schools for a long time. Can you rewind us on the prospects that visited Tuscaloosa this last Saturday when when prospects could get back on campus? Yeah, yeah, you know, I was able to have uh, you know have some top guys in Tuscaloosa last Saturday and. You know, some guys that uh, they were really excited about getting on campus included um, uh, a couple of LSU commitments. Cardell Thomas, who's the number one offensive guard in the 2019 class, and, uh, and Tyrion Davis, who's a four-star running back, both from Southern Lab High School in in, uh, in Baton Rouge, same high school as um, Alabama freshman linebacker Chris Allen. So, you know, he's going to be working those two guys uh, for the next few years. You had Conus Miller, the four-star defensive lineman from uh, Jackson Nolan High School in Birmingham, one of Alabama's top-tier uh, recruiting targets. And, you know, right now, I think I still think Alabama is a little bit behind Florida and Auburn, but with him deciding to wait until after his season to make a decision, I think it gives Alabama a little bit of a chance. And you know, the more he gets down to Tuscaloosa, um, you know, the better opportunity they're going to have with him. Uh, Clay Webb. Five-star offensive guard in the 2019 recruiting class out of uh, Oxford High School in Alabama. Uh, made his way back down to Tuscaloosa. And, of course, uh, Pierce Quick, uh, 2019 offensive line commitment, was uh, was back down in uh, in Tuscaloosa for the for the practice. Pierce really doesn't 
miss much uh, that goes on down in Tuscaloosa. If there's ever an event down there, he's down there. And he's kind of like a, an extra recruiting coach for Alabama. He's always recruiting top guys and, you know, always trying to get uh, get guys to join uh, Alabama's class. But one name in particular that I think gets a lot of people interested is Harold Joyner because Alabama wants a running back in this class. And they missed out last week on Asa Martin, uh, who ends up picking uh, Auburn instead of Alabama. Harold Joyner. Uh, out of Mountain Brook High School, you know, he's a big kid. He's six foot three, uh, about two hundred twenty pounds. You know, a lot of people look at him as uh, maybe he's just an athlete. Maybe he'll play outside linebacker, or, or could play safety, or maybe receiver, or H back once he gets to college. But you know, he's uh, he's still playing running back, and he rushed for close to two hundred yards and four touchdowns in in week one of his uh, his high school football season. So. Now, there's certainly a lot of interest there, and um, you know we'll see what happens, and we'll see if Alabama makes a big push for him at some point. Give me, give me your breakdown on on Saturday night's game, man. You rolling with the tide? What's going on? Well, I think so. I think it's going to be a, an, an excellent game. I mean, you you look at both rosters, and it's just stacked with with talent um, that, that I've you know I've seen all these guys. Yeah, you know, a lot of them at least at, at several camps throughout the years at, at the Rivals Five Star Challenge. Uh, Under Armour All America game, you know, you name it. These guys have, uh, these guys are the best of the best in the country. And, you know, I think, um, I think Alabama's got a very explosive offense. I think they, they have a lot of talent. And it's going to be very interesting to watch uh, Brian Dable's offense uh, perform on, uh, on Saturday night. And, uh, you know, just wait, see how uh, Jalen Hurts responds after, uh, you know, after the end of his season last year. And I think he's going to be, uh, pretty locked in. I think uh, you know they've got a stacked, uh, you know, running back group. They've got a really good offensive line, and and I think uh, they're going to be able to wear down Florida State. Now it's going to be it's going to be a, a heavyweight bout. I mean, it's going to go back and forth, back and forth throughout the night, and uh, I think it definitely comes down to the fourth quarter. I don't think there's it's not going to be like the Alabama USC game last year. There's there's no doubt about that. It's it's going to be a tight battle throughout the night, but I think Alabama is going to be able to pull away in the end. They, they do really well in Atlanta, and um, I think they're 10-0 and in Atlanta under Nick Saban. And, and um, I think after after uh, you know, Saturday night, they're going to have another win under their, their belt. Next on the program, we have Warchant.com's Ira Chaffel. Chaffel joins Warchant.com from the Tallahassee Democrat. He's filled with the wealth and knowledge you can follow all of his great work from the Florida State perspective on Warchant.com. Glad to have you on the show, Ira. Hey, how you doing, Kyle? I'm uh, just excited for the big game. It's finally here. Yeah, finally, man. I mean, it's it's been so long since there's been college football, so I am so excited, especially for a game of this magnitude. Is is there is there excitement in the air? Obviously, I was suspecting Tallahassee. Oh, uh, there's no question. It really has been for a while. Uh, and I think, you know, FSU had their kickoff luncheon uh, last Friday, and it was – packed you know with alumni and uh, it was probably the best biggest turnout i've seen in a long time and uh yeah i think people are just you know they've been talking about this game for so long i think people are, are a little bit restless now they, they want it to actually they want to see it actually happen florida state last year 10 and 3 was rewinding to last year was florida state supposed to have the year that they eventually had you know, it was kind of, uh, it was probably a little uh, less than they had hoped for. Uh, you know, I think that going into the season, I think myself and a few other people I, I know thought, you know, it was probably a, a team that, that would compete for the ACC, but probably wouldn't win it just because Clemson had Deshaun Watson back and, and they were really a loaded team. Um, but, uh, you know, they had some losses that were really unexpected. Obviously, you know, the Louisville game, not just losing, but get, getting blown out was a surprise. Uh, losing at home to North Carolina was a big surprise. Uh, but they finished really strong, so that kind of took the bad taste out of everybody's mouth. You know, they, they uh, in the second half of the season, they played really well against Clemson, uh, had a chance to win that game. Uh, you know, they beat Florida and Miami again. They're two big rivals. They uh, beat Michigan in the Orange Bowl, and they just played better in the second half of the season. So I think, uh, you know, there were still con- some, some frustrations about what happened early in the year. But they finished strong, so that kind of uh, made people at least feel a little bit better going into the offseason. And that kind of alludes to my next question I was going to ask you is, how much of their ending success, beating Michigan 33-32 to in the Orange Bowl, how much of that momentum has carried over into the offseason leading up into this game? 
You know, I think the biggest thing is is it did. It, it, there were some some younger players who had to step up late last year because of injuries and, and other issues. Um, and I think it gave those guys some confidence. I mean, a couple of key guys are Keith Gavin had the uh, big kickoff return in that game that kind of set up the winning score. He um, he's going to step in as a starter at wide receiver. He hasn't caught a pass yet, but he start he's expected to start a wide receiver and really has had a great camp. And I think that game kind of uh, kind of gave him some confidence that he carried over into the offseason. Nyquan Murray, uh, the other wide receiver who had two touchdown catches in that game, he wasn't really a factor for FSU in the first half of last season. Uh, because of an injury to one of the seniors, he got in, um, made a lot of big plays late in the season. I think he's uh, really carried that over, and they expect him to be one of their top playmakers. Uh, and then defensively, you know, the, the final score doesn't look like it. Because you know Michigan scored 32 points, but FSU played great defensively in that game. They gave up a couple of plays on special teams and uh, I think a turnover that uh, created some points for Michigan. But but really defensively, they played a great game. And and again, I think that just kind of capped off a big turnaround uh, for the defense uh, over the course of the season. Now coming into this season, Florida State. His defense has been dubbed by many as one of the best defensives coming into the 2017 season. Um, Ten. 10 defensive starters really return if you include Derwin James. Can you can you kind of just walk us through from the big boys up front to the secondary and just kind of fill us in on on what Alabama fans should expect come Saturday evening from Florida State's defense? Yeah, sure thing. It's uh it's a lot of guys that are very familiar faces for FSU fans. Um they've got a lot of experience especially in that front seven. Uh you, you know from defensive end, uh Josh Sweat is a junior is, a, is basically started since midway through his freshman year, he was a big-time recruit coming out of high school. Uh, had a you know an okay freshman year. Last year had seven or eight sacks, but battled some injuries. He apparently has had a great preseason. Um, you know, I think he's he's kind of their top defensive end overall. He's also solid against the run. Their defensive, the other defensive end is Brian Burns, who is a, more of a speed rusher. He had nine and a half sacks last year as a true freshman, which was uh, number one in the country for freshmen. But he. Um, it was a little bit undersized. I think he's maybe about 230 pounds now. Uh, I think the questions about him are, can he hold up if Alabama tries to run at him? Uh, but he's a really gifted pass rusher. Uh, inside, the defensive tackles are, are both back. Uh, Derek Noddy is kind of the, the leader of the group. He's, uh, uh, pretty, he's, he's not the biggest defensive tackle. He's not like a 330, 340-pounder, but he's very athletic and very strong for, for, for a 300-pounder. And... Uh, He's probably the most the, the the guy who can make more plays in the backfield. Uh, the other defensive tackle, Demarcus Christmas, is a little bit more stout, more of a run plugger. Uh, he's also back as a as a second year starter. The linebackers were supposed to be all three seniors. Uh, usually they'll play two linebackers um, in a lot of nickel coverage, um, but when they go three linebackers, uh, they've got um, Roderick Hoskins is a middle linebacker. He's a two year starter that. Uh, kind of had a rough go early last season, like a lot of the defense, um, but seemed to play much better in the second half. Uh, the other uh, strong side linebacker, uh, when they go with three linebackers, is Jacob Pugh, who really had a great uh, uh, spring, was the MVP of the spring for FSU. He's a guy that they'll use sometimes in coverage, sometimes coming off the edge as a rusher. Uh, he's a pretty versatile guy and also another senior. And then the, the third linebacker spot is the one that's kind of up in the air. You know, it's supposed to be Matthew Thomas, another senior who uh, had a huge end of last season. Um, he's had some eligibility issues, has not practiced in the last two or three weeks. And uh, at this point, it's hard to imagine him playing in this game because he hasn't really practiced yet. Uh, Jimbo Fisher keeps saying he's expected to be back at practice. But again, I just can't imagine a linebacker uh, playing in a game like this with only a couple days of practice. Um, the secondary uh, is a very veteran as well. It's, it's safety. You've got, as you mentioned, Derwin James is back. Some people think the best player in college football. Um, uh, the other safety is Trey Marshall. He's a two or three year starter. Uh, is very solid, very solid, steady safety. He's going to miss the first half though because of uh, got hit with a targeting penalty in the second half of the bowl game. Um, so they'll probably start a junior, AJ Westbrook, in his place, uh, who's played a lot last year because Marshall had some injury issues. Well, they, Derwin James was injured, and a couple other guys were injured. So he played a lot last year, even though he wasn't a, really a full-time starter. And then at corner, you've got uh, Tavares McFadden, who gets all the attention. He you know, tied for the uh, national lead last year with eight interceptions. 
uh, tall, 6'2", real athletic, uh, kind of uh, impressive physically uh, cornerback uh, who has really good ball skills. And then the other cornerback will be a new uh, starter, Lamonte Taylor, who is a uh, was a big five-star recruit coming out of high school a couple of years ago. Played uh, some last year as a nickelback uh, or in dime coverage. Uh, this will be his first year as a starter. So I think, you know, looking at that secondary, if, if you had to say a guy that they're probably going to target, I would think for Alabama, it would be Lamonte Taylor. And then a linebacker with Matthew Thomas likely out, they're probably going to start a sophomore named Emmett Rice who is really athletic but hasn't played a lot. So I think those two guys, if I'm FSU, I'd be a little concerned about Alabama trying to target those guys in this game. We're speaking with Irish Afel of Warchant.com, breaking it down. The biggest college football game in the nation this Saturday night between number one ranked Alabama and number three Florida State. You can catch all the coverage for Alabama on BamaInsider.com, all the coverage for Florida State on Warchant.com. Ira, in a game like this, and we're switching to the offensive side of the football right now, so much is predicated around the quarterback play. And I find it very interesting that each Alabama, as well as Florida State, have sophomore quarterbacks who fared very well as freshmen during the 2016 season. We we know about Jalen Hurts and his capabilities from the Alabama's perspective. Speaking about DeAndre Francois, what type of a player is he? I, I know that he had a very productive season last year, throwing for 3,300 yards, 20 touchdowns, only seven interceptions. Can you can you highlight Francois and what he brings to the table? Yeah, DeAndre's got probably similar skills to Jalen Hurts, uh, although they use him in a different way. Jimbo does not usually like to run his quarterbacks quite as much. Um, you know, it, it's more of a, he's kind of a – Use it if, if the opportunity arises, they'll do it, but he doesn't like to build off of that usually. Uh, DeAndre, so he's athletic. He's not uh, an amazing runner. He's no Lamar Jackson, but he, but he can run. Um, but I think you're, you're going to see a much better passer this year from DeAndre Francois. I think, uh, you know, in practice, and I know practice is different than games, but in practice, he is a very, very accurate passer. It didn't always show last year at times, uh, especially a lot of the underneath passes and uh, you know, kind of swing passes, things like that that you would think would be easier. When he stepped into his throws last year, he was pretty accurate. Um, and I think this year, his knowledge of the offense is much better. Uh, last year, he was a redshirt freshman. He, he um, you know, I think he knew the offense, but it wasn't second nature always. And I think sometimes his um, his uncertainty with some, some things led to some inaccuracy as a passer. I think he's going to be much better as a passer this year. And I think so a lot of people think that FSU is going to be really, you know, kind of controlling the ball with their back. They've got a lot of talented running backs and that they'll play a little bit more ball control. I'll be surprised if, if they don't throw it a lot. I think they love their tight ends. They love their wide receivers. If they can uh, protect the passer at all, I think they're going to, you're going to see more of DeAndre Francois throwing the ball this year. Again, we're speaking with Irish Chaffel of Warchant.com. Continuing with the offense, if you could break down the running backs. I know uh, Jack has Patrick last year led the team with um, 350 yards, or at least he's a returning leader, and also Cam Akers. Can you kind of hit on those guys and what they each bring to the table as well? Yeah, you know, there, there was uh, – Jack was Patrick was the backup uh, to Dalvin Cook the last couple of years and played well when he got opportunities. Dalvin got banged up a couple times, and, uh, and Patrick filled in and filled in well. Uh, I think he had 100 yards each time he ran uh, as a starter, and uh, – you know, filled in well, but he's not as dynamic as Dalvin Cook. You know, he's, he's, he's bigger. He's about 230, 235. Um, he's a little more physical. He's, he's agile for his size, but he's just not, you know, he's not going to break off the 70, 80 yard runs the way Dalvin Cook did. Uh, so that's going to be an adjustment for fans. And because of that, I think a lot of people were thinking maybe one of the young running backs, like you mentioned, Cam Akers, who came in as one of the top two or three running backs in the country. Uh, that maybe he would beat him out because he was an early enrollee and looked really good in the spring. Uh, they also have a couple other. They have another five-star running back, Kalen Laybourne. Uh, they have another kid who's a sophomore that didn't run play much last year because he was injured, but they love him, Amir Rasul, who's more of a game-breaker, a kid from Miami. Um, they're really talented running back, uh, but Jacquez Patrick you know, kind of held them all off. He had a really good offseason, a really good camp. Um, you know, and I think the plan right now is Jacquez Patrick will be the featured back. I think he'll be the guy that gets probably, you know, 15 to 20 carries. Um, but Jimbo, I asked Jimbo on Monday, and he said, yeah, there is a plan to get those other running backs involved. Uh, he said they've earned it. They've proven that they can play at this level. 
So I think you're going to see Cam Akers and Amir Rasul particularly get a, get a few carries or maybe some swing passes, things like that. And then if they do well, I think then he'll start giving them more carries as the game goes on. But I think P Patrick will be the main guy. Um, but if, if he's having a hard time getting going, I don't think they'll hesitate to, to give one of those younger guys more carries. As we move forward in the podcast with Ira Shafell of Warchant.com, we, we start to look at the keys of the game. And as you mentioned earlier, Florida State's offensive line stopping Alabama's defensive line. Can you talk about that matchup? I mean, Alabama obviously returns again one of the top defensive lines in the country. Uh, Florida State's line, can uh, do you do you foresee a, a potential struggle there? I know that's been kind of one of the the storylines that people have been asking about on our website. Yeah, I mean that's that really to me in, in a lot of ways this game is going to probably hang on that. Um, you know, it would be hard if you were predicting it. It would be hard to predict that Florida State's offensive line is going to. Uh, win that battle or even tie that battle just based on what we saw last year. And these are mostly the same guys. A couple guys have switched uh, where they're lining up. But this is mostly the guys that played offensive line for FSU last year with a couple of changes. And uh, and they they really struggled. They gave up 30-something sacks last year. Um, so I think that um, you know, it would be hard to go into it with a ton of confidence. Uh, but at the same time, I think they'll be better. One area I think they'll be better – is an offensive line this year is in the middle. I think their guards are really solid. Uh, they've got a, a guy named Cole Minshew and uh, the other guys, Landon Dickerson, too. You know, 320, 330 pound uh, kind of road grader offensive lineman. I think they, they feel good about them. And Alec Eberly, the center, is uh, coming off a of hip surgery, but he's much healthier than he was last year. He, he kind of played injured last year. So I think in the interior of the line, they're going to be better, which is big because. Where Francois got a lot of pressure last year was up the middle, and for a shorter quarterback, that's that's problematic. Uh, I think the the question mark is the tackles. Can their offensive tackles hold up against Alabama's defensive ends and linebackers? If they do, I think FSU's got a great chance to win the game. If they can't, it's just going to be a tough day uh, for FSU because um, you know I just think that you know, Francois is going to have to make th plays through the air for them to to win this game. And if the tackles don't hold up, that's going to really uh, inhibit his ability to do that. Switching to the the matchup between Alabama's offense and Florida State's defense, what do you think the key to the game is in terms of Florida State stopping Alabama's offense? And and kind of from your perspective, what do you think Alabama's game plan is going into this? You know, I think it's going to be what they what it always is. You know, and it, and I think it, and it makes sense based on what FSU has uh, coming back. I mean, I think FSU's really strong on the defensive line, and I think they're really strong in the secondary. Uh, and I think the key is going to be if FSU can handle Jalen Hurts as a runner, uh, Scarborough, their backs, if, F if FSU can at least keep them honest with the running game and not let Alabama just take over the game with the running game, I think FSU's got a really good chance to, to, to keep Alabama somewhat in check. Um, the problem will, will lie if, if, if they have to start bringing up safeties to really help to stop the run they're going to be in trouble because I don't think Jalen Hurts is, is, a, is a tremendous college football passer, um, but he can hit, hit guys who are open. And uh, if FSU has to really start cheating up and then they get beat with that play action, you got receivers like Ridley and Judy and those guys, uh, you know, that, that would be a tough situation for FSU. And, and they've had a hard time stopping uh, you know, mobile quarterbacks. So I think really Jalen Hurts is probably the key. I, I think FSU can match up a little, you know, pretty well stopping uh, – Alabama's power running game, but if Hurts starts getting on the perimeter and getting on the edge, uh, FSU's had a hard time with that. And again, uh, if that becomes their big concern, then I think he can hit them with some passes over the top. Let's say these two teams are pretty much equal on on both sides of the football, right? So, the, so the cancellation, let's say, goes out to the special teams. How is Florida State's special teams in all parameters? Punting, uh, place kicking, uh, kick returners, punt returners. Can you tell us about Florida State's special teams? Uh, you know, they're hoping it's going to be a lot better than it was a year ago. It was, and Jimbo Fisher puts a big emphasis on special teams, just like uh, Coach Saban and, and, and all the great coaches do. Um, and he was really not happy with the way they played last year. They didn't return the ball well. They didn't cover kicks very well. Uh, and they didn't kick it very well. It was just a complete uh, breakdown across the board. Part of it was uh, some inexperience, a, a kicker. Uh, Ricky Aguayo was a, was a true freshman. 
Logan Tyler, the punter, was a true freshman. Both those guys you know, had to step in and, and had their moments. I mean, they showed some talent, but they also were very inconsistent. Ricky missed, um, I think he missed three field goals in the North Carolina game that they only lost by a few points. Um, he had a couple other uh, rough games. Uh, Logan Tyler, the punter, uh, again, so much of punting. He's got a big leg. He, he, man, he could kick it 60, 70 yards, but he's had some issues with his consistency in the direction. So, you know, the, the coverage might be going to the left side of the field where they expect it, and he might have kicked it to the right side. Um, some issues like that. And he also uh, had, had a few too many uh, kind of line drive punts, which were very returnable. They feel like those two guys have really improved this offseason. They've put in a lot of time and effort, and now they're a year older. They're sophomores. Um, so, you know, they're, they, they're, they are hopefully confident that those guys are going to be better. If they're not, it, it would be a huge uh, liability for them again this year. We'll have to see uh, in games. I, in practice, they've shown signs of being better, but we'll, we'll have to see when the lights, the lights come on. And then they've made some, a lot of kind of changes in the return game to really get that going. Uh, you know, the last few years they've used kind of smaller, uh, kind of more scat back kind of return guys. This year they're going with much bigger return guys. Derwin James, the safety. Uh, Keith Gavin, who's the big 6'3", 6'4", wide receiver. Those guys are going to be your two top kick returners. Uh, both have great size and strength and, 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 and really good speed. And then uh, Tavares McFadden, the All-America cornerback, uh, who's a 6'2 kid, uh, will be the punt returner. Um, so those are all basically new guys in the return game. And, uh, you know, they all bring size and speed. And uh, I think they're hoping to be able to, to at least, if not necessarily break the 80-yard return, at least get up to the 30 or 40, give the offense better field position. Because uh, that was really an issue last year. Speaking with Ira Shafell of Warchant.com, breaking down Alabama and Florida State. All the coverage for Alabama back on BamaInsider.com. For Florida State, check out Warchant.com. Talking about the coaching matchup now, and as we wrap up, we're, we're closing out the preview with Ira. Um, Jimbo Fisher, I found this very interesting. Florida State 9-1 and against SEC opponents under coach Jimbo Fisher. Um, and, and he's been so successful at Florida State, you know, with a career record of 78 and 17, great winning percentage um, in eight years. Uh, what Talk about the coaching matchup and, and kind of um, highlight what Jimbo Fisher does well as a head coach at Florida State. Uh, yeah, I mean, his record against the SEC is is, is obviously really good. And, it's, and it's, um, it's one of the things that, you know, I think that's why he kind of took takes umbrage when people, um, you know, you know, he was one of the big defenders of the ACC even a couple years ago before uh, everybody started to recognize that the ACC was pretty good. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as far as the head coach, I mean, I think he's really come a long way. Um, I, you know, I don't think he was a finished product when he took over. Uh, I think, you know, he had, he, had some, he had some issues he had to fix his first couple of years. They had, uh, you know, he made some mistakes in judgment uh, in terms of, I know one game, one game that stands out was they played uh, – at Wake Forest, and uh, he didn't start his EJ Manuel at quarterback because EJ had been banged up. They ended up going with a backup that turned it over a few times in the first half. They got in the hole and couldn't come back and win. And uh, you know, I think he learned a, <clears throat> learned a lesson from that. Uh, I think he learned a couple other uh, lessons about handling players and handling star players and things like that. But over the last uh, you know six, five or six years, he's really um, and also his coaching staff. I think early on. There were some issues. I think some of the assistant coaches felt like he micromanaged a little bit, and I think he really changed that. He went out and hired some more experienced assistant coaches and has kind of turned more over to them, which has been, uh, I think, helpful. Um, but as far as his overall philosophy, he's, you know, he's very similar to Saban. Uh, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he likes the idea of people thinking he copied Nick Saban. I think he feels like they kind of established a lot of their philosophies together. Um, but it's kind of an old school approach. I mean, he believes in defense. Uh, he believes in special teams. He believes in being able to, to be uh, versatile on offense. Um, you know, he doesn't like these, you know, the, the, the proliferation of spread offenses. He feels like that's fine to have in your system, but he doesn't feel like you should depend on that and have that be all you, all you do. Um, so he's, he feels like they can win in any style, uh, kind of a boxer that can fight in different styles. I think that's how he views uh, his team and, and that they can play a more physical slow down tempo or they can go up tempo if they need to. Um, and he tries to kind of uh, take a professional approach. You know, they don't, 
Um, you know, I think during the season he, he's real cautious about hitting too much. Um, uh, he's, you know, he's very process oriented like Nick Saban. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the, 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 his greatest strength, though, may be off the field and recruiting. He's done a great job um, of, of evaluating talent and getting those players in. Uh, probably, you know, him, Nick Saban, and, and uh, Urban Meyer, I think, are clearly are the three best recruiters in the country. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty good company. Speaking with Ira Chaffel of Warchant.com, we appreciate him joining us today on the podcast. Wanted to ask you one final thing as we close out, and this is an important one. Does Florida State feel like an underdog going into this matchup in Saturday's game? I think they're confident. Um, I think they're confident that they can win this game. I think they know that people see them as an underdog, and I think they'll try to, to capitalize on that. Uh, but the sense I've gotten from you know just talking to players and coaches and people around the program, uh, you know, I think they feel like they got a really good shot. Um, now again, you know, there's there's you know you never know until you get in the in, in the game. It's like you know the the Mike Tyson quote about everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and uh, you know, and I think that that's kind of especially a season opener. You know, just you just don't know exactly what you've got. You don't know exactly what they've got. Um, and so. You know, I think they're they're confident, um, but I do think there's a chip on their shoulder knowing that uh, very few people outside of uh, their team in, in Tallahassee expect them to win this game. Next on the program, we have Bama Insider.com's own Tony Sakalis. Tony is our team writer, joined Rivals.com this year. Happy to have you on the show, Tony. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all your great work. What's going on, man? How you been? Hey, doing pretty well. Busy, Crazy right? Game. I mean, my goodness, yeah. we've been we've been flying through coverage on BamaInsider.com. Um, Want to jump right into it? Um, what should we expect from this Alabama offense under new offensive coordinator Brian Dable? You know, we're gonna get to see the the first true test of that uh, come Saturday. Uh, there's a couple things to watch out for. You know, I think how they use the tight ends will be interesting to watch. Uh, obviously, with him coming from New England, being the tight ends coach there, that's something that you know I think a lot of people have talked about. Uh, maybe getting the tight ends more involved in the passing game. Uh, I, I could see a lot of more passes out of the backfield to running backs. You know, that's a strength Alabama has. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how they use that. Of course, Josh Jacobs is probably their best pass catcher uh, running back, and, and we're not sure of his status as of uh, today. Uh, I think we'll find out that a little bit more uh, Wednesday uh, Wednesday evening when we talk to, to Nick Saban. But um, – It'd be interesting to see how they pass out of the backfield as well. And then just, just you know, Jalen Hurts' maturity and, and, and how he's been able to work with his quarterback and, and see if, if that's changed as well. How much of Alabama's offense is really, and the, I guess the overall success of the offense, is predicated around the success of Jalen Hurts' passing ability? Well, yeah. I mean, I think if if he can't pass, then then they're gonna have a lot of problems, you know, because then you can stack the box, you can stop the running game. That's that's kind of what happened against Clemson. Uh, it, uh, you know, Jalen Hurts wasn't able to really move the ball too much through the air, and and so Clemson stacked the box and was able to stop Alabama's running game. Of course, it didn't hurt that uh, Bo Scarborough was out. Um, but yeah, I, I think if if you make Alabama a one-dimensional team, just like most teams, if you if you turn them into a one-dimensional team, they're they're easier to stop. In your opinion, what did Jalen Hurts do well during the 2016 season as a freshman? You know, for a freshman, I think he did he did great. Um, he he moved first of all. I mean, he's very dangerous with his feet. Uh, he didn't make too many mistakes. Um, now, granted, I think he was playing in a, a safer scheme than than. Maybe he was a, a little bit handcuffed into what he was allowed to do with the ball, but um, I think for a freshman, his poise, uh, whenever he was rattled or whenever he did make a mistake, he was able to kind of bounce back and, and really answer the call, and then he came up in clutch moments. Uh, you know, the LSU touchdown run in the fourth quarter, the Clemson run, which could have been the game-winning touchdown in the national championship game. You know, both those moments, uh, that's a lot of poise for a freshman to have. This Alabama rushing attack, I mean, there's so many guys that can potentially hold the rope in, in their proven backs. And can you, can you talk about the Alabama running backs and, uh, you know, what fans should expect come Saturday night? Yeah, I, uh, it's going to be – it should be pretty good. <laughs> um, you know, you've got Bo Scarborough coming back. I think a lot of people are expecting a lot from him. He's going to – 
be able to, you know, offer that ground and pound uh, downhill running style. And then you've got other backs. Uh, Najee Harris will be interesting to watch. Um, you have the number one overall uh, recruit in the nation in 2017. And he's somebody that can really do it all. It, he's kind of also a power running back too, but he can, he can catch out of the backfield. And we saw how dangerous he looked doing that in the open practice this preseason. So it'll be interesting to see how they use him, how much of an impact he makes right away. Of course, you can't forget about Damian Harris, the 1,000-yard rusher, another multi-tool kind of versatile back that can either run at you or, or catch out of the backfield. So Alabama has some options. Uh, if Josh Jacobs is available, he's another option that they have. Um, but if not, Brian Robinson might play. He's another talented freshman. I think somebody that gets overlooked a lot as well can do everything kind of like Najee Harris can. So um, there's a lot to be excited about. That's going to be definitely one of the things to watch uh, this Saturday. Staying with the offensive side of the ball, highlight this receiving corps. I mean, Calvin Ridley is one guy that everybody knows about. He's been extremely productive at Alabama. But who are some other guys that, that surround him in terms of the wide receiving corps and what Alabama brings on that side of the football? Yeah, yeah. Robert Foster, I think, is probably the biggest big play threat, you know, home run threat, if you will, on the offense. You've seen a special chemistry between him and Hurts this preseason where, you know, when Hurts makes a lot of those big throws, it, it just so happens that a lot of them are to, to Robert Foster. Uh, I, I, I think I'm expecting a lot, uh, a really big year from him. You know, he's dealt with a lot of injuries, hasn't ha had the easiest of breaks during his time with Alabama, but I'm expecting a real breakout season from him this season, and uh, especially if, you know, Ridley garners a lot of attention on the other side. Then in the slot, you have Jerry Judy and Cam Sims, and I think both of those players can really contribute at that spot. They were listed as co-starters, which I think surprised a few people. Uh, Cam Sims was kind of the guy everyone thought was going to win that slot role, and I mean, he, he probably will start if they start with a slot receiver, but I can see Jerry Judy also coming in in that spot and really providing maybe more dy dynamic receiving ability. He, he's more shifty than Cam Sims. Cam Sims is kind of the bigger guy, can help with blocking, and, and also presents like a bigger target over the middle, but uh, Jerry Judy's another player that can that can make some electric plays, so it's real interesting to see what Alabama can do. Uh, they have so many things they can do with this offense. It's just real interesting to see how it all play out. We're talking with Tony Sokalis of BamaInsider.com. You can find all of his great work on the website, BamaInsider.com. Talking about the offensive side of the ball right now, going into Saturday's game against number three, Florida State. Tony, tell me about the offensive line. I mean, it, it looks to me like Alabama is going to average 315 across the board. You mentioned today in your article in, in Five Biggest Questions, the right side of the ball still not ex exactly solidified, but can you kind of walk us through uh, Alabama's offensive line? Yeah, so I think the first four from left to right are pretty set. I think everyone knows that. It's just going to be Jonah Williams, Rosh Pierce Bucker, uh, Bradley Bozeman, and Lester Cotton. Um, the, that's a big offensive line to start. Um, you know, you got Jonah Williams, a, a, all, a freshman All-American at right tackle. He switched to left tackle. You got Pierce Brocker, all SC, a preseason All SEC, pretty steady at left guard. Bradley Bozeman might be one of the most underrated players on the team. He was, I think, the highest graded player on Alabama last season. Um, if not, he was he was the highest graded lineman. Uh, really steady anchor there at center. And then Lester Cotton, who's seemed to, you know, make a lot of improvements this off season at right guard. So they're pretty set with those first four. Then at that right tackle position, it looks like Matt Womack will probably get the start, but Jedrick Wills, a five-star freshman, is providing a lot of competition. Um, you know, both players, Wills and Womack, um, are, are studs as well. They're, they're big guys. They're over 300 pounds. Uh, Womack's 6'7", Wills is 6'5", but, you know, they, they both play very well. So it'll be interesting to see uh, – who Alabama goes with at that right tackle position. I, I think it will be Womack just because we've seen him take more first team reps than Wills during practice, but you never know. You never know what will happen between now and Saturday. And, and it'd be interesting to see if Wills gets some playing time regardless of whether he starts. Maybe they'll shift, uh, maybe they'll rotate him in a little bit uh, depending on the situation. So uh, that's definitely something to watch as well. Switching the defensive side of the ball. Does this defensive line have enough talent to hold the defensive line excellence that Alabama's had in the past? I definitely think so. Um, you know, with the, you're replacing Jonathan Allen and Dalvin Thomas, two great defensive linemen. 
but you still have Deron Payne in the middle, and that's going to be key. He's a very uh, athletic defensive tackle. He's not just your average, you know, big guy that just sits there and eats up blocks. He can move around. He can he can get after the quarterback. He can bully offensive linemen. I, I really like him up the middle. And then you got Deshaun Hand uh, on one side, uh, a, a former number one overall uh, signee. Um, he hasn't really made too much of a difference at Alabama yet, but he hasn't really had the opportunity to with, you know, Jonathan Allen in front of him. So I think he's probably the best pass rusher on that defensive line, and I, and I expect him to, to really kind of come into his own in, during his senior season. On the other side, it looked like we would have uh, Raekwon Davis. Um, you know, he was involved uh, in, in a shooting on, Saturday, on Sunday uh, outside of a Tuscaloosa bar. Um, I... I the reports are that uh, his injury, his, his he got shot in the right leg, and uh, the reports are that the gun shot it was not you know not a severe wound, um, but it, we we don't know. He's listed as day to day by Nick Saban. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if he practices uh, uh, today and Wednesday. Um, he hasn't practiced Monday and Tuesday, so if he doesn't practice today, I think I'd you know probably put him at doubtful if he's out there today. Uh, Wednesday, you know, um, he might have a shot at playing. So there's really nothing, there's no way to know about him until we at least see him in practice or talk to Saban uh, later today about his status. But he's somebody that can really uh, contribute if he plays. Highlight the linebacker group. Um, you know, I, I kind of want you to kind of give fans like a, a, just an overall preview. And the linebacking corps for Alabama, very strong, especially right in the middle with Rashawn Evans and Sean Deon Hamilton. Yeah, and they have a really good partnership uh, dating back to playing uh, uh, select uh, basketball, travel basketball with each other. You know, <laughs> I think their basketball <laughs> days are, are well over, but that, that chemistry cannot be uh, understated uh, enough. Um, just, just how important that is. Uh, having those two in the middle is, is going to be really important, especially with the young guys uh, coming in on the outside. You know, you have. Christian Miller, Anthony Jennings, Terrell Lewis, they're all pass rushers. They're going to be uh, replacing guys like, you know, Ryan Anderson and Tim Williams. And so uh, they definitely have the talent to do so, but uh, they're inexperienced. So having guys like, you know, Sean Deon Hamilton and R Rashawn Evans in the middle to kind of, you know, maybe, maybe keep, you know, the, the mood calm in, in, in the defensive huddle, you know, a lot of times in these openers, you know, nerves can really get to you. So having two veterans in the middle like that is, is really going to be important. And then, you know, talent-wise, all four linebackers at Alabama is going to march out there if they put four down, four on the field. Uh, they're all going to be pass. They're, they're all going to be pass rushing threats, and they're all going to be uh, just really skilled guys. So th there's a lot of talent. It really just comes down to how that experience will play out. And I, and I expect Alabama to have enough experience to be able to to do the job Saturday. The secondary. I mean, all, all week we talked about Minka Fitzpatrick, but it's not only Minka back there. I mean, the secondary returns a ton of experience. Go ahead and highlight those guys. Sure. You know, you've got Anthony Averett on the uh, on, on one corner, and then we've seen uh, Trayvon Diggs and, and Levi Wallace kind of play in that other corner. Um, that That's probably the situation, the, the spot I would circle is, is that left cornerback spot between Diggs and, and Levi Wallace. Diggs is listed as the starter, uh, but uh, Wallace has seen some first team reps too during practice. So it'll be interesting to see. I, I think Diggs will get the start there, but he'll be on somewhat of a short leash. You know, if he struggles early, then then Wallace might see some time. Um, you know, at, at the safety positions, you've got Minka at strong safety and Ronnie Harrison at free safety. But we've seen Minka move around to to even star on the nickel package and money uh, in the dime package. If he moves down to one of those positions, Hootie Jones will take his spot at strong safety. Um, you know, Tony Brown has been, uh, he's listed on the depth chart as a star. We've seen Minka play there. Uh, it, it will just depend on, on, on the package and, and what Alabama's feeling at the time. But there's a lot of talent there uh, in, in that secondary. It's probably the strongest unit Alabama has on defense. So um, there's not, uh, you know, there might be a little bit of concern in the depth once you get out of that first team. But as far as that first team goes, there's not much to be worried about. Alabama has the pieces to kind of contain Florida State's passing game. Give us, a, give us a special teams update. I mean, if, if these two teams are even, let's say, going in on offense and defense and it comes down to special teams, what, what does Alabama bring to the table special teams-wise? Well, at punter, they're set. <laughs> They've got one of the best punters in the, uh, in the nation in J.K. Scott. It, kicking, not so much. Um, the field goal, 
situation is uh, shaky at best, I think, right now. I mean, there, in, until we see improvement uh, during a game, it, it's it's going to worry a lot of people. Uh, Alabama lists uh, both Andy Papanostos and uh, Joseph Bolivos are two uh, kickers. Uh, they list them as co-starters. Uh, J.K. Scott's also probably a co-starter at, at, at the long field goal position. So I, I think it'll be between Papanostos and Bolivos for those short-range field goals, maybe you know inside of 40 yards probably. And then J.K. Scott might come in for the longer ones. Um, it's obviously, you know, Alabama has done that in the past, and it's it's worked. It, it's had sometimes mixed result, but most of the time it's worked for Alabama in the past. It'll be interesting to see how that two kicker dynamic works if they, if they want to use that uh, this season. Um, but you know, the, Alabama's just looking for consistency in the in the kicking game, and that's something that none of those three have really provided yet. So, uh, if one of them can step up, that would do that go a long way to easing some nerves for for a lot of the Alabama faithful. <laughs> Alabama favored by seven points in this game, according to Vegas. Tony, does Florida State have Alabama's attention? And, and what have the players and, and Nick Saban said going into this game about the respect that they have for the Seminoles? Oh, yeah, of course they have their attention. This is the biggest game, in, you know, probably maybe in the season, the regular season. Um, yeah, and, and it's the opener. So uh, Alabama fans have been uh, – I mean, uh, Alabama players have been uh, – really focused in on this game uh you know i, I think they're ready to play a, a different opponent besides themselves uh so that that opener is always gets more attention that you always get more excitement so having a team like florida state playing in a new stadium like mercedes-benz stadium it's it's going to be really exciting for the for you know for alabama and it's it's something that uh i, I think i think nick saban likes having these kind of big games because it, it does give you that extra focus during that opener when you know, when you really need it, when you really need to be extra focused because, you know, there's still some rust you have to shake off. What are the keys, I guess, the overall keys to success for Alabama in a game like this going against Florida State? What do they need to do Saturday night to win this football game? You know, they they can't make mistakes. They, they can't make turnovers. I think, you know, uh, that's one thing that, you know, the Florida State could take advantage of. If, if, if they're able to rattle Jalen Hurts early, maybe get him to – and that's really hard to do, by the way, is, is rattle Jalen Hurts. But if they're able to make make him turn over the ball early, and then and maybe shut down that passing game, then they can they can limit Alabama, and then maybe they can try to work against that Alabama defense, keep that Alabama defense on the field. That's something that we saw in the national championship game that, that Clemson did was, uh, if you keep that Alabama defense on the field, then you can wear them down. Um, and, and I think that's their best shot. I think you know Clemson kind of provided the model of how to beat Alabama. Uh, it's not easy to do, but that's kind of what you have to do. Uh, you have to shut down their passing game and then keep their defense on the field. Next on the program is Nick Saban's Wednesday teleconference. This was recorded Wednesday morning. Travel to Atlanta to face Florida State Saturday at 7 o'clock Central on ABC. If you ask a question for Coach Saban, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad now. I believe we have Coach Saban on the line. Coach, good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good. While we wait on questions to start the season, uh, would you mind taking a moment to comment on your team as you prepare uh, for the Florida State season opener? All right. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is our thoughts and prayers go out to the people affected by Hurricane Harvey, and we're very thankful that the players that we have on our team from that area, uh, their families are safe and everybody's okay, and we're doing as much as we can to support and help the folks in that area that are having issues and problems. Um, obviously, this is a great opportunity for our team to play against an outstanding Florida State team. Um, you know, this is a, a challenge that I think, you know, people look forward to uh, playing in the, these kinds of games. And you find out a lot about your team in the first game. And um, people have to understand if you're going to be able to conquer the adversity that you have to overcome and play in a really good team you have to prepare yourself well so you know you can do it before you ever get there and that all comes with your ability to focus on execution doing your job on taking care of the ball playing with effort and toughness and all the fundamental things and execution that are going to help you have a successful offense defense special teams We'll begin with David Pascal, the Chinese Times Free Press.
Hey, Nick, is it a concern when you go to a place like Mercedes-Benz that has halo boards and things that are brand new to all this stuff? I mean, is there a concern that the that could serve as a distraction to your team, or do you hope to kind of knock all that out with a walkthrough, you know, when you first see the place? Well, we're going to go over there on Friday, which we usually don't do. Um, and we played in Dallas twice, which is, you know, a pretty, well, really three times, um, pretty same kind of an awesome place. And we took the players over and let them walk around and, you know, do their gawking on Friday. And, Hopefully, when the game comes, they'll be focused on the game. But um, I think mature competitors that have been in situations like this before handle this a lot better than young players. But um, hopefully, our young players will show the maturity to be able to handle it as well. And as a follow-up to what you were just saying, I mean, how, how nice is it to have someone like a Minka Fitzpatrick in your secondary who you've talked about can play multiple positions, but just – when an opener happens and, and there's that always kind of the unknown, how nice is it to have someone like him back there? Well, I think any time you have experienced players, and uh, that's not something we have an abundance of on defense because we lost so many good players, but uh, the leadership that Minka provides, the example, the diversity that he has as a player, the playmaking ability is always welcome, but uh, we're going to have to get that kind of leadership and example from the three or four other guys that have been starters for us in the past, and um, hopefully they'll they'll be a, a positive influence on on the guys that are starting maybe for the first time. Thank you. This is AP Stedham of Bama Mag. Uh, good morning, Coach. Morning. Coach, what are the reasons for the proliferation of non-offensive TDs by your team the past two seasons? I, 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 oh, I guess I, I barely heard the question, but I'm assuming that you're asking. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat it for you. I said, what are the reasons for the proliferation of non-offensive TDs by your team in the past two seasons? Right. Well, I think we had a lot of playmakers on defense, a lot of guys that uh, attacked the ball, a lot of guys that could rush the passer on loose plays, um, you know, a lot of guys that had good ball skills in the secondary and at linebacker. So um, it was kind of a, a, a joint effort by a lot of players. I think we emphasized the ball a lot, you know, doing turnover drills every day to start practice. Um, you know, where to go when you get a turnover, how to run it back and try to make a big play. And our players bought into that and did a really good job of it. Um, you know, that's something that we're trying to emphasize this year again. How well we can do it sort of remains to be seen. Thanks to Steve Moltz and WZZN. Hey, Coach, good morning. Good morning, Steve. I uh, was hoping you could uh, comment on Deshaun Hand and how he's taken uh, since the incident occurred of what he's been able to do to um, you know, do the right things to get back on the playing field. Well, he's done everything that he's, we've asked him to do, and he's had a very good fall camp and played very well for us. And he has a history of being a good person and a good student around here. And, um, you know, he's we're looking forward to – uh, him having the opportunity to compete and hopefully have a great year for us and continue to set a good example uh, for the rest of the players on our team by making good choices and decisions about what he does and what he doesn't do. Um, you know, I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, we all get born and that's kind of our D and someday we all pass and that's kind of our D and, you know, the C in between is all the choices that we make um, in our life and that sort of defines who we are and I think most of us have made a mistake or two somewhere along the way and hopefully somebody was good enough to give us another opportunity uh, so that we had a chance to um, maybe learn from that mistake and do something better in the future and that's certainly our hope for Deshaun. Is there any update on Raquan Davis? Coach? Uh, he's day to day and um, he has not practiced yet, and it's a medical decision that when they decide that he can go out and do something, we'll, we'll use him accordingly. Thank you, sir.
Next is Ron Crocher to San Francisco for Chronicle. Nick, um, Najee Harris is obviously from our area out here by San Francisco. Um, I was curious uh, what he's shown you in spring and through summer training camp and how realistic it is that, that he can, can significantly contribute here as a true freshman. Well, I don't think there's any question of the fact that he's done an outstanding job um, in his development here through spring practice and also fall camp. And uh, right now he is going to have an opportunity to play in this game. And uh, I think he'll make a significant contribution to our team throughout the season. And we're very excited that he's here and, um, you know, sort of trying to encourage his development in every way that we can so that he can be a, a very positive performer for us. And if I ask one quick follow-up, what, what skills maybe are farther along than you thought when you recruited him, and where does he still need to, to improve to, to reach that level in the SEC? Well, he's got great size, speed. He's very instinctive as a runner. Uh, he's a good receiver. Uh, I think all freshmen, you know, the knowledge and experience, understanding the offense, having the confidence, um, you know, those are the things that only come with repetition uh, and playing experience, and uh, we're going to be very patient in his development. Coach, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Following Nick Saban's Wednesday press conference, Jimbo Fisher also held a Wednesday press conference. Here's Jimbo Fisher on Wednesday. Coach, just a brief opening statement, then we'll go to questions. Uh, yes. Uh you know, finally game week is here. Very excited about that. Very excited for our players to play a different opponent. Had a very long, hard camp, which meant everybody did. Uh, like the response of a lot of things we have, we're fixing to see where our strengths and weaknesses are. I feel very good about camp in that regard, and then we'll uh, move from there. But, you know, we got a great opponent the first game. You know, right off the bat, Alabama's going to be a very well-coached football team. It's going to dot eyes, cross teeth, and then also they're going to uh, – play hard they're gonna play very hard and they're very talented so we have our hands full in every respect of the way but it's also a great challenge in the things you come to florida state to play in these kind of games so looking forward to that challenge it will be a huge challenge but at the same time uh i think our players are up to it and uh, we're anxious to go play another team so and get this season started but saying that questions please if you'd like to register for a question please press the one followed by the four and our first question is from tommy dees with tuscaloosa news please proceed Morning, Coach. Good morning. I uh, wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about your days with Nick Saban. I know you've talked about it a lot. What I wanted to know was it, what, what's something specific that you got from him that you <clears throat> use as a head coach uh, now? Uh, I mean, there's a few things. because he, The thing about he and I that he always thought, and then I think he said it in an article someone told me it was interesting, that he had said, we, we think philosophically very similar. We have very similar ideas in this. And the thing about the way he – his all-encompassing program about how to develop players and that how offense plays the defense and defense plays the offense, and you don't separate yourself. I think it's one of the greatest things Nick does is build that team concept. He, you know, people say, well, sometimes he may, you may think he wants to be a conservative. That's not at all. Nick wants to do what he has to do to win the game. And I think that's his first and foremost thing. And I think he always kept that in the forefront in his game planning, his scheming, whether it was offense, defense, and special teams to each other and how the game – had to be played, and then you know, it was over encompassing uh, development of players. I mean, and he's a tremendous, he's obviously a tremendous football mind. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Andrea Adelson with ESPN.com. Please proceed. Jimbo was wondering if Matthew Thomas uh, returned to practice and if he'll be playing on um, Saturday. If he, if he, he did not return to practice yet, but. Uh, Thought he would have by now. If I, if we thought he would have had been there, but uh, we'll see. And if he's if he's ready to play, he'll play. As far as eligibility, he, I mean, he runs on his own, stays in conditioning from everything I hear. So as far as that, he knows he knows our scheme inside now. They practice the first week, so he's been doing it for a long time. Are are you concerned you might not have him on Saturday? Mm, I don't know. I mean, until he gets there, you're always concerned. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Paul Woody with Richmond Times Dispatch. Please proceed. Good morning, Coach. Hope you're doing well. Um, 
you mentioned in your opening statement that it was a long preseason. Was it too long? Are there any adjustments you'd like to see in the preseason length? You know, for the first time going like that, it was long, but also it was very good. It allowed you to spread things out, told you to slower pace, make adjustments as a coach. It wasn't all crammed in a certain area. It wasn't as bad as, as, as the new the schedule. I kind of liked it, in, in, seriously. I don't know what hoops would be necessary to jump through for the NCAA to approve this, but would you ever be in favor of taking a, a couple of days or a week and going someplace and practicing against another team? Me, personally, no. Why not? I guess what I believe. On the champ. You know. Okay. And the risk of injuries and everything else would be, would be greatly advanced up. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And our next question is from the line of Gene Frenet with Florida Times Union. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, Jimbo. Uh, last year, uh, the ACC, by general consensus, was considered the, the best conference in the country. Mm -hmm. do, you think that, do you think something like this is sustainable? Uh, for the, when you look at the resources programs have, do you think it's sustainable for the ACC to continue to, to be on the level with, uh, with the SEC moving forward? I do, and I think if our financial package continues to increase, our network and all those things, I think are extremely critical in doing that, I think, for the future of it. But, yes, I do, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, like I say, whoever – here's the thing. Whoever you say is the best, it's all an opinion anyway. So I just know this. Mm -hmm. I coached that league a long time. I've played all the, the other leagues. We're as good as a league as anybody. To say we're the best, I think we're right there. And I think the top teams in every league are great. But at the same time, I think we're, we play as good a football as anybody. And uh, – and for the rest of it, it's an opinion. It keeps you all something to write about and talk about on the talk shows. But I think our caliber of ball and the, and the, the conference and the games we play is, is a very tough gauntlet, just like those other leagues. Uh, as a, as a follow-up to that, uh, you, you, you and Clemson both play two SEC opponents this year, and there certainly will be more opportunities for conference teams in the bowl games. Do you feel like these games, well, you know, if you can win uh, these, these games early on, it adds to the perception that the ACC is really one of those top-level conferences, especially when you consider Miami 10 years in the league and they still haven't even played in the ACC title game. Well, I, I think this. I think we're a top league. We're a top in this league no matter what happens. Our, our conference is as good as anybody. Our, the, the wins, we play well against those teams. I definitely do. But I think we've already proven it. We've been there. This hasn't been a one-year thing. It's been the last four to five years. So whether who's better, but we're all right there. Uh, either 1A, 1B, 1C, however you want to look at it, whatever they may be. So these games definitely mean to that, and they help that entourage. But at the same time, I still think our caliber ball, that's been proven over the last five years. I don't think one year is going to make anything any different. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And our next question is from the line of Heather Dinich with ESPN. Please proceed. Jimbo, how has um, this summer been different because of who you're opening with as opposed to opening against an unheralded, unranked opponent? No, not any different because last year was Ole Miss for us. It was number 11. So, I mean, Alabama, it hasn't been any different. The only thing it does, your kids have attention just like we did last year. You have to have great attention to detail and a great urgency to do things. And sometimes, you know, it motivates you, I think, every day because you know, listen, I don't have time to, you know, if, if – and when I work out today, i got to work out a 1,000%. I can't give it 90% or 95%. You hope your kids don't ever do that. But at the same time, it's realistic. And knowing who you play, you got to you got to really be in shape, conditioned. And, you know, you may have watched, they may have watched more film, things like that. But our, our actual summer itself, our, our whole procedure and operation never changed. Do you prefer to open up with somebody like that because of everything you just said? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it don't. I think it all matters on your team. I think – so certain years it's really good to do it, so others ain't. I think it matters on the personality of your team and what you have back. But the problem is you, you book those games so far ahead. But it, I mean, it definitely does, but it, sometimes it can really be challenging. So it just you know, it picks one way, half dozen the other, but it's great for college football. I do know that. And like you said, we'll be interested to see how, how these games are rewarded when we look at the national uh, attention and all the things that go with it. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question is from Brendan Sonnen with Knowles 24-7. Please proceed. Hey, Jimbo. There, uh, 
I forget the exact number, about seven or eight true freshmen listed on the projected two deep. Uh, I guess, what do you like about the group of newcomers uh, that, that has allowed you to give them confidence or give you confidence that, that they can contribute you know, as early as this first game? Well, I think their maturity and poise, I think a lot of those guys have shown that and they've shown it in practice so they wouldn't be there. And I think their intelligence level, their ability to learn and pick things up and adapt very well. And they, and they, a lot of them have been here. So I think in that regard, it makes it a lot easier to play those guys. And like I say, you, they, you've got to play them sometime and you've got to get those guys ready. I think the development of your young players is really critical to your season success. Do you have a feel for, for you know, I, I, you like to say, you don't know until you know until you get to see it. Do you have a feel for how they're going to handle the, the spotlight on, on Saturday? Heck no. Heck no. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> I wish I did. I mean, you just don't ever know they go out there. I think they'll do well. There, there may be a couple of tough moments, just like their young guys will play. I mean, whoever. But I mean, mm-hmm. you know, that's just that's just part of growing up and playing. And you gotta, you gotta just coach them through it and move, move through it. All right. Thank you, Jimbo. Thank you. And our next question is from Steve Moulton with WZZN. Please proceed. Hey, coach. How you? Fine. How are you? Doing well. Um, uh, Nick Saban earlier this week uh, talked about you know, the basketball. And, uh, he would always go out and pick you. I was wondering if there any rules in particular on that basketball for uh, Coach Saban. You, you were breaking up. I'm sorry. I heard you just say something about picking me in basketball and rules about Coach Saban. I, part of that. You broke up when you asked the question. Please repeat it, please. Oh, okay. It was about the Coach Saban said that he would go out to pick you, and was wondering if elaborate on. That. Yeah, we did. We, I mean, uh, he was a very good player, and obviously, must thought I was a good player. We we played together and kind of complimented each other. We thought, again, we think alike, played alike. We were comp- and we're both very competitive. So we always, you know, it's always say you want to always say this about players, and and it's kind of about players too. Let your team pick your spring game. You'll see you'll see a lot about it. You'll see when you go to the park, there's certain guys you know you want on your team, guys that play like you, have personalities like you, are competitive like you, or you think have good games. And I think maybe that was it. But, I mean, uh, we attracted each other and we played very well. He was a very good player. Obviously, he thought like, we could help. So, we always had good team. We always had a good team. And, and uh, he always got the first pick. So, he was commissioner of the league. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Coaches, Mike Finn in Greensboro, thanks for being with us today. Good luck this weekend. And we'll talk to you next Wednesday. Thank you, Mike. Well, thanks for listening to the BamaInsider.com podcast. I hope you've enjoyed our show. Remember, you can subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. Just look for the BamaInsider.com podcast. You can also listen on YouTube. We're bringing you coverage every single day on BamaInsider.com. Now is a perfect time to subscribe to the website with the football season underway. Alabama, Florida State is finally here. All the recap and coverage back on BamaInsider.com. Reporting from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, but I'll see you in Atlanta. This is Kyle Henderson of BamaInsider.com.